Today we're talking North Carolina barbecue, innovations in higher education, and socially conscious media. I'm Carlton Hargrove, and this is 282. Thanks, folks, for tuning in to another episode of 2A2. Today, as usual, we've go we're going to tackle a host of hot local issues. And as usual, we're joined by a trio of guests who will chime in on all these topics. But before we meet them, let's say what's up to 2A2 producer Jarvis Holiday, who is, because we are talking about barbecue, I'm saying you're over in the smokehouse today. I'm Jarvis in the smokehouse. smokehouse. That's right. right. What's up, Jarvis? What's up, Carlton? How you doing? And man? just for the record, because Carlton is originally a Midwesterner. That's right. Uh, when we're talking about barbecue today, we're talking about barbecue that has barbecue <laughs> sauce. Not barbecue in the verb that you all like to use for <laughs> cooking out or grilling. But uh, shout out to everyone who's watching us on the live stream. You guys can follow us on Twitter at 282TV. If you want to comment on the topics, use hashtag 282TV. And we're incorporated to the show. Yes, we're talking about barbecue, and uh, I'm from the Midwest, so we will be talking about it in various t terms, correct terms, Midwestern terms also. But anyway, well, let's meet the guests. Let's meet everybody. Uh, well, at the end, we've got Kathleen Purvis, who is a food editor at the Charlotte Observer. Uh, we've also got Gary Ritter in the middle, who is a history instructor at CPCC and also one of the coordinators of an event coming up called Ed Camp. And we've also got David Johnson, who is with a nonprofit group called Silent Images. Thank you guys for joining us. Did I get Thank everybody's you. name right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I didn't get any crazy looks. Well, <laughs> Only about barbecue. Okay, well, <laughs> well, let's start talking about barbecue, okay? Everybody uh, wants to start there. Everybody, I know. It's like, I love barbecue in, in all the different ways that you might talk about it. The act of it, the food, whatever. Um, and I think, you know, it's funny when the DNC is coming to town, and I know Michelle Obama, like, months ago said, yeah, I can't wait to get some of that North Carolina barbecue. And although Charlotte's not not necessarily known for barbecue, North Carolina is, you know, mm -hmm. we're starting to get, a, to get a few spots here and there, like in, uh, restaurants and places to buy, you know, uh, all kind of food. Some are older and some are newer. Mm -hmm. But I want to just have a big conversation about it. Um, and, just, and do we have more than 30 minutes to talk about it? We're just <laughs> so talking about talk barbecue, barbecue today. It's in all North Carolina, barbecue, that right? Is a big subject. But give us an overview of barbecue in Charlotte. Like, where can we find it? What are the different types? Okay. Quickly, um, you know. I know. Okay, let me give you a quick rundown. Um, <clears throat> there's a difference between barbecue in Charlotte and barbecue in North Carolina and okay. South Carolina. As poor Mrs. Obama found out when they made the announcement about the <laughs> DNC, and people immediately said, what do you mean you're going to get barbecue in Charlotte? Um, Charlotte has a new barbecue tradition, emerging barbecue restaurants, but that's not the history of the really traditional North Carolina barbecue restaurants. So what when you say new, how long places ago? Like, well, places like Max have okay, come along right. in the last few years. Uh, there's Q City. Um, there's you know there's a number of places that are newer. We mm -hmm. do have some older, more traditional places, but um, for instance, Bill Spoon's Barbecue on right. South Boulevard. Uh, a lot of people have a really, really strong feeling about um, Old Hickory House, mm -hmm. um, Old Hickory Smokehouse. You know, those are great places. They are not necessarily in the tradition of those really traditional Carolina barbecue restaurants. So what's the difference in the terms The difference of the is the, 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 the traditional North Carolina barbecue restaurant generally dates back to the 50s. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're cooked over wood if they're doing it right. Not every place does anymore because wood is very, very difficult. But uh, they're, they're sort of centers of their communities. They're mm -hmm. small restaurants in smaller <laughs> towns and rural areas, and they're cooking over wood. In North Carolina, you've got places that have to do it a little bit differently because they're in a city and they're going to be charging a little bit differently and it's going to be a different experience. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's bad. It right. just means it's different. So if you asked me, you know, I'm coming in from the outside, and I get this call all the time. People people love to explore North Carolina barbecue, mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll contact me when they're coming into the state and they'll want to know where to go. I'm going to send them to different places than if I were just going to say, yeah, go get great ribs for lunch. Okay. Um, and one place, I mean, I'm going to send them to... Uh, Red Bridges Barbecue Lodge in Shelby. I'm going to send them to Lexington Number One in Lexington. I'm going to send them to Skylight Inn in Aden, where you know they they still shovel the coals in under the pigs every single night. Well, what kind of so? But what does that look like when I get a plate of something from, let's say, Lexington? <laughs> 
am I looking at pulled pork? Is you're it, looking what at is chopped it? pork? Chopped pork. Um, okay. the, the phrase pulled pork has come along in the last five or six years hmm. as kind of a way for people outside of North Carolina to get their heads around what we consider barbecue. Okay, you're not going to get ribs like you're going to see in Memphis. You're right. not going to see chicken. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to see sliced <laughs> barbecue like you might see in Texas off a of brisket. You're going to see something that's chopped up. Right. And where it comes from on the pig has a lot to do with where it's being made. Okay. Eastern North Carolina barbecue is whole pig, has meat from all over the pig, mm -hmm. um, has a vinegar-based sauce that's mixed in after the pig is cooked. Okay. Lexington style, which sometimes mistakenly gets called Western, but actually isn't Western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. People think if there's an Eastern, there must be a Western. It's really Piedmont, Lexington area. Uh, that's going to be shoulder only. The mm. shoulder of the pig. Okay. And the sauce that once again is going to be mixed in after they've cooked the shoulder. Okay. And it's going to have vinegar, red pepper, and a little bit of tomato. Hmm. Sometimes just from ketchup. Okay. Let me, I'm going to pass it around to these guys because I, I do want to get your take on your personal experiences with barbecue. Are you big barbecue fans in terms of the food or the act of doing it? Do you grill out? I'll start with you, Gary. Well, um, as we were <clears> saying, I think, and, and we saw this mentioned earlier, when I first moved down here, I had no idea what barbecue was, so I thought it was the verb, okay. not, not the actual noun. <laughs> so the first time I ordered it, I got the plate. I was like, what is this? I was expecting, you know, like barbecue chicken. So, right. Uh, but over time, I've really come to like it. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm a fan. Yes, he's okay. a convert. We're, a convert. We're proud okay. of him. He studied well. What about you, David? Well, you know, I've... I, I come from the Midwest, but my mom comes from Memphis, Good and job, so and Midwest. so the, uh, the the barbecue that I'm that I'm used to getting is a little bit different than the North Carolina barbecue. But I've I tell you I've learned to love kind of North Carolina barbecue. Even when I go back to Memphis, uh, I would say I prefer North Carolina barbecue. But I have a question for you: How if we go to a restaurant, how do we know that, or how can you distinguish between whether it's been really wood cooked over wood or not? What's what's the yeah, it's What's and, and that? it, that's sometimes hard to tell. And yeah. you really, to, to find out, you need to go back and look at the pits. Um, mm -hmm. And if they are cooking over wood, there's going to be pits, and there's going to be a wood pile back there. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a wood pile that does not have spider webs on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's not probably going to be a lot of sign of gas tanks in the back. I mean, yeah. I've had places that have told me, oh, yeah, we cook over wood, and then I go around back, and there's a sea of LP gas tanks. Um, you mm -hmm. know, that, that's kind of a dead giveaway. Yeah. Well, here's, here's a question I have. Because I am from the Midwest, and I'm actually from sort of the Chicagoland area, which is a which big... Which is great barbecue. And the <laughs> what we consider barbecue is basically ribs. You yeah, know? yeah. And ribs are very... Like, when I eat a rib, I know when a rib is good. Uh -huh. When I've eaten uh, barbecue in North Carolina, I don't really know, like, is this really, like, supposed to be the apex of what is good? You know, like, I don't really know. Like, yeah, because yeah. I find that the flavor is very mild and subtle. And is it, that it what is. it's supposed to be? Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, we don't really, in North Carolina, you don't focus so much on, say, putting barbecue sauce on something while it's cooking. Right. You're really focusing on the cooking method. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be really smoky. Now, I did a big project last year, ran um, around 4th of July in the Observer, on wood-cooked barbecue and the, the restaurants that are still doing it and how hard it is for them to survive. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, Wilbur Shirley, one of the great, figures of Carolina barbecue restaurants told me the way you can tell the difference between um, get barbecue that's cooked over gas and barbecue that's cooked over wood is that with um, with the pig over wood they, they put it skin side down mm -hmm. uh, I mean they put it they put it uh, fat side down so that all night long that fat drips down on the coals mm. and it creates the flavor and it permeates the meat. Okay. And the meat is also not greasy at the end of the night. Mm. With gas, they can't do that because they you can't have fat dripping on a gas jet. You're going to have a fire. Right. So they flip it so that it's skinned down mm. and it becomes like this sort of big bowl of fat. That's interesting. And so yeah. it ends up being greasier. So okay. if it tastes greasy, then there's a good chance that that was not cooked over wood. Let me go to Jarvis. I think we've got some comments from social media about this topic. I believe we always do. <laughs> yes, we asked on Twitter. We asked several questions dealing with North Carolina barbecue. Uh, we asked um, uh, what are some of their favorite barbecue restaurants in the Charlotte area. Um, at events, Shelby NC says, if you're talking NC barbecue, you must know about Austin Bridges and Red Bridges in Shelby. At Chad Reed 71 says, Max Speed Shop. At Guy Peters, I, Guy underscore Peters says, 521 Barbecue South of Sun City in Lancaster County. Not in CLT per se, but Primo. Uh, at Charlotte CPA says, at Q2U BBQ, of course. Um, and several folks said, the Q, uh, 
Queen City Cube. We also asked, um, do they prefer Eastern or Western style? Uh, we got at Dave Wynn says Eastern style barbecue hands down. Um, at J Scott twelve fifteen says Eastern. Uh, we asked if they prefer vinegar based or mustard based sauce, which all that stuff is confusing to me. But as, <laughs> at Ross Collins says vinegar all the way. Uh, at Chad Reese seventy one says vinegar. At Katie Down saying vinegar. So not many people seem to be feeling mustard based sauce. Maybe Kathleen can explain that. Is that more of a South Carolina thing? Yes, it is. Uh, Mustard based sauce is a South Carolina (laughs) tradition. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't understand mustard sauce until I went to a place called Sweatman's Barbecue um, in South Carolina. It's outside of Orangeburg, sort of near Orangeburg, Florence, Mm -hmm. about an hour out of Charleston. If you're coming back from Charleston, it's a good lunch break. Um, they do a really authentic version of the mustard sauce. And the mustard sauce is not yellow mustard. It's sort of an orange sauce. Hmm. Um, and it really, you know, when you have it with whole, whole pig barbecue, it really, you start to understand, oh, okay, this is, this is what that taste is supposed to be. Right. It's, it's a lot richer than you realize it is. Okay. Now, uh, if, for people who want to get some nearly authentic North Carolina barbecue in Charlotte, Name a few places you would suggest. I love, you know, I love Bill Spoons. Okay. Even though they're not cooking over wood, um, it is a place that in the feel and the style and the family feel of it, it's an Eastern North Carolina barbecue place. Uh, you know, it okay. really has the feel. Um, and then the other places are, you know, places like um, Red Bridges and Austin Bridges and Shelby are not really that far. I yeah. mean, really, Shelby's only, what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, depending okay. on how fast you go on I-85. Uh-huh. Um, so it's not that hard to get over there and get the real stuff. Okay. You know, besides the restaurants, the other interesting thing about the barbecue is the history of it being part of communities, part of churches, way to raise money. Right. You know, I think the fact that, you know, if you're, if you're going to do a big pig, it, it takes a while. You've got to uh-huh. be out there. So, you know, you got the guys who are there for two days, and it's sort of a, a social thing. It raises mm-hmm. money. Um, and it also brings in politics. You know, you have the politicians right. as Absolutely. a place to Absolutely. The Mallard come Creek Barbecue, the, Mallard the fact Creek. that we have the Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church mm-hmm. Barbecue every October, that is one of the great events. Wow. Um, and we have terrific Boy Scout barbecues around yeah. here yeah. still. You know, yeah. Trisha it, it always, talks always been about a community thing. thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. 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 Um, cool. And actually, they say with the whole pig, the Eastern style, mm-hmm. that's <laughs> how that style started was it was something that was done to celebrate the end of harvest and to thank people who had helped you and reward them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you cooked a whole pig. You can feed a lot of people on a pig. That's cool. So that's where it came from. We could talk all day about barbecue. (laughs) Yeah, we (laughs) are. No, I'm just kidding. No, we're going to switch topics. We're going to switch topics. But uh, we're going to actually start talking about education. Um, And, you know, it's uh, interesting. We were discussing this in our meeting last week about how higher education has sort of been this fodder for in this political season recently you know you've had like rick santorum mm-hmm. kind of jab obama saying he's an elitist for wanting everybody to go to college right. and then you've had people talk about now when you look at the unemployment rates that people who are really chronically unemployed don't have college degrees right you know mm-hmm. compared to folks that are getting jobs sure. uh but you know there are innovations in higher education and one of the things i guess you guys are doing as part of this ed camp is exploring those things and I want you to just start out just kind of telling us what EdCamp is, and then we can kind of link sure. it together. Well, EdCamp is based on the, on the concept of, of Bar Camp. And Bar Camp is something that's been happening in Charlotte now for the past three, four years. Uh, just recently had Bar Camp 7. And the Bar Camp model is the unconference model. So as, you know, if you go to a, sort of a normal conference, the agenda is set out months in advance. You know, people get calls for proposals. You have a committee that's going to vet, you know, what the sessions are going to be. There's right. a program, you know, you sign up. With EdCamp, that, that doesn't happen, or a bar camp. Um, so, in essence, what we do is we invite anybody to come, and basically everybody gathers, and we say, okay, who wants to make a pitch? Mm-hmm. And so you have 30 seconds where you pitch an idea. It could be, um, you could say, you know, I want to talk about how I'm going to use social media and education. I want to talk about, you know, digital textbooks, these things. And then after everybody makes their pitch, what we do is we take these, basically these giant post-it notes and we write on there a short description and we paste them on the wall. And then you sort of have this organized chaos for about 10 minutes where we just give people Sharpies and they go around and mark what they want to see. And then we vote and that determines the conference. Okay. So it's kind of nice. You know, I've been to conferences. I went, I remember one conference in particular where I went and the people leading the conference had flown in all the way from Turkey. Three of them, and I was the only one who went to their session. No oh boy, you know, so that you know, you in this when you have it this way, you know that people are actually bo- voting. They want to see it, so you're going to get the people coming to each of those sessions. But what if, and and I just want to ask this out of curiosity, sure. and then we can get to the education yeah. stuff. But if 
like, how do you know that you have people who are sort of experts in the fields that you are voting on? You don't. Oh, wow. So you could say, let's talk about, you know, scuba diving. <laughs> and nobody's a scuba diver or ever went scuba diving. How do you really delve into that subject? Right. Well, you know, that's part of the risk of, of, of the whole thing. Oh, okay. You know, um, now, we, when, when at a bar camp, you have all kinds of different topics, right? Mm. There's, there's no sort of <clears throat> subject that we're going to talk about. Now, we are theming Ed Camp on education. Okay. And so we're really targeting um, educators. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this year we're making it open to the public as well. So anybody who has an idea can come. Okay. So mm -hmm. what kind of stuff, well, I mean, I, I guess you don't know the agenda for exactly. this. Exactly, right. <laughs> what are some things that you would like to see explored in uh, and then what are some things, I guess, how, did that, how does that really connect with higher education and making it more you know, innovative and better? Well, to give you an example, some of the topics that were popular last year, uh, we talked about a, a psychology teacher gave a, a demonstration about sort of the dynamics of professors who have sort of a phobia of teaching in front of people hmm. and, and the psychology behind that, and that was a really popular one. Uh, we talked about some Web 2.0 tools, um, things like Wikipedia and YouTube and how that can be used in the classroom. Uh, we talked about just moving around the classroom and what it's like to sort of, where, you know, this where you physically are as an instructor, how that can change, you know, the reaction that students have. Okay. So what we're really looking for are sort of innovative things. We're looking for, you know, what's working for you. Um, but a session can be different. It doesn't have to necessarily be, here's what I'm doing. It can be a question, right? I can, I can start a session and say, look, you know, I'm interested in doing this. I'd like to find out what other people are doing about it. Let's just sort of have a, a roundtable conversation about this. Right. So, you know, the beauty of it is that it's really organic, it's democratic, and it's, it's variable, the kinds of sessions that you can have. Right. Well, let me ask you this, and I want to pass this around. I'm going to start with you and pass it around. But what do you think, um, I mean, uh, I guess I want to find out what do you want to see in education? I mean, you know, being a, an instructor and then working on a project like this, I would assume you have opinions about how to make the, the institutions better or work better or students learn better. I mean, what are your own, I mean, personal, I guess, philosophies or theories or things that you want to see happen? Um, that's a good question. I, I'd like to see that we're trying new things, but we're also learning from what worked in the past. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see more sharing about what does work. So, you know, you might have one teacher doing great things, but if they're doing that in isolation, you know, that, that's only really affecting those 30 students in the class or okay. those, you know, however many sections that's, that teacher has. Mm -hmm. But if I can say, look, this is really working well, I, I'm getting feedback from my students that this is working well, I want to sure to share this with other people. Right. So EdCamp is a really great place to do that. And not only is it great to learn, but it's also great to meet people you know, it's a good networking event. Okay. Kathleen, what do you think? What are some things, I'm, I don't know how much you interface with the university system here. Actually, uh, a lot. My son's okay. a, in the university system okay. in Nashville. All right. So <laughs> what, do you, what are some things I guess you want to see to make higher education, uh, uh, to innovate it, to make it uh, more effective? Or, or do you feel like it's fine? Um, I love the North Carolina system. I okay. mean, I think that we are really, really lucky if we have kids in North Carolina because we have an amazing and well-integrated um, university system where you know you have campuses that specialize in different things. Mm -hmm. um, my son is very creative and he's a writer. UNC Asheville was the perfect place for him. Okay. You want to be a teacher. You can you know you've got great programs at UNC Greensboro and mm -hmm. and those things are all worked into uh, private industry all across North Carolina. We've been innovators in this. Okay. So I, you know I love the North Carolina system. I am wondering though I, and I'm worrying uh, these days with the economy being the way it is you know, kids getting out of school without the ability to earn a living off of a bachelor's. And, yeah. of course, everything. The New York Times is doing a big series right now on the, the problems of education loans and how that right. really sinks you before you can even step out the door with that bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. yeah, is that, that something you guys are going to discuss at all, the, you know, financing education at all? I mean, again, it, it, it could, could be. be. You never know, <laughs> right? Okay. It sounds like what you're doing yeah. is a giant mm -hmm. brainstorm. Exactly. It's a really giant brainstorm. And, and to get back to your piece, I read that story that The Observer ran um, from The New York Times mm -hmm. about student mm -hmm. loans and there's over a trillion dollars. I mean, this is a huge deal. Yeah. I mean, part of that is, you know, it, it, there's a potential that interest rates could double um, if something isn't done this summer. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's another thing that, you know, is, is important for access to, to education. But David, I'm going to get you to chime in on yeah. this. Some things you want to see, I guess. Well, well I guess, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been on both sides. I was, I was a school teacher for eight years, and so I've been on that side of, of you know, kind of trying to educate the students to prepare them for, for college. And now I'm running a nonprofit that's looking to hire these recent graduates. And most of our hires are the ones who are coming straight out of college. And I think 
definitely one thing that that is frustrating is, is that they're coming. They want to they want to go work for a nonprofit where they're <clears throat> unfortunately not going to make a lot of money, mm -hmm. but they're coming out with huge loans. Mm -hmm. And so they're bad on like you know here's my passion, here's what I want to do, but I have to pay off this loan. The other thing that I'd be curious to hear you speak to is that. I, I'm, I'm seeing a trend of, of a lot of students who've kind of gone through the machine in the sense of they've gotten their degree, they've, they've sat and listened to people lecture at them for 12, you know, 16 years. But I'm not seeing students who are coming out with a great skill set. Like, hey, this is what I'm really good at. You know, I mean, and so that's, and, and, and honestly, as, as I speak to other people who are looking to hire, the two things they're looking for are people with character and people with a skill set. What mm -hmm. can they do? And so, how how is how is how is do you feel like the higher education is shifting or, or preparing students to kind of identify that skill set and say hey you know this is and it may not be a traditional job that's out there saying I'm going to hire you for that but hey this is something I'm really good at and and how do I use that to leverage you know I th I think um, something that's been in the literature a lot lately is is trying to improve critical thinking skills mm -hmm. and so it might not be I know specifically how to operate a camera but I have the critical thinking skills where I can sort of learn how to do it. Um, you know, that's something that we, we, especially at CPCC, really try to incorporate into as one of our sort of core competencies for what students, you know, finished graduates would have, you know, the ability to think critically. Um, you know, you mentioned lecture. Um, you know, lecture is still an important part of what happens in the classroom, but it's not the only part. And what we're seeing really in the past 10, 15 years is trying to incorporate more of what we call active learning, right? So in my class, I really, you know, almost all of my classes are really discussion based. So I might, you know, have, let's say, a slideshow, but I'm not just going to stand up there and read the entire slideshow and everybody's a passive, you know, recipient of the knowledge. It's more of, here's what I have. What do you all think about it? You know, how do you react to this? How can we discuss this and, and make it relevant to what you all see happening? So, you know, really bringing <clears throat> students in, and, you know, and especially in the community college where we have you know, students who have life experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, more life experience. Everybody has life experience, right? right? Sure. But have been through things and, you know, really can bring, you know, more of what they've been through to the class and, and use that, you know, can we tap into that? Can mm -hmm. we share that with everyone else? Okay. And if you can design a classroom management that, that builds on that, then I think you're going to get closer to having students who will come out with skills. Okay. Mm -hmm. I might have to move on. Uh, when is it camp? It camp is uh, tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, All right. It's going to be on CPCC campus in the Health Career Center building. We're going to have uh, two pitch sessions. Okay. So 9 a.m. and then again at 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to come and pitch something about Smurfs. I want to just do it. <laughs> you got to tie it to education. It's going to win. <laughs> huh? But anyway, I, I want to I talk about silent, uh, silent images. Uh -huh. And tell me all about your organization. Okay. okay? All right. So uh, we're a local nonprofit that basically uh, uses photography to... Um, go out and gather stories that traditionally would not be covered by headline news. Okay. So internationally, for example, two weeks ago I was in um, Burma uh, documenting the uh, the refugees there who are kind of caught in the middle of a of a of a battle um, at the border of China and Burma, and they're a minority group. and And so I've come back with a, a series of images um, that will now uh, exhibit at the Art Institute of Charlotte starting next week for the next couple of months. So we're trying to use photography to educate people, challenge them to go beyond the headlines of what traditionally is covered, and, uh, and kind of say, hey, he, these are stories of injustice around the world, mm -hmm. locally or internationally, that, that we want to have discussions around. So where, uh, where are the other places, I guess, that you funnel this, the content through? Is it just... So, well, I, I do a lot of lecturing at, at universities, um, trying to take these galleries to universities, have discussions around whether it was Darfur, Sudan, or whether it's homelessness right here in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, so yeah, so lectures at universities, high schools, churches, civic groups, and then galleries like this. Um, and then we've, we've published two books that are out in the bookstores oh, that cool. people can read. Now, how, how well do you think local media covers the issues that, you know, you guys cover with Sally Images? Um, well, uh, unfortunately, not great. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, you know, I mean, I think I think there's a lot of initial coverage, uh, but then after that, they move on to something else that that is going to raise ratings. What are so? What are some things? Uh, uh, are you talking about issues like poverty, or I mean, what issues are we discussing? All, all, all across the board. I mean, uh, whether it's uh, like I said, whether it's genocide in Dar in Sudan, or whether it's uh, the refugees in Burma, or whether it's homeless kids right here in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. um, it could be. Uh, we spend a lot of time in Haiti. Uh, we spend a lot of time in Central Africa uh, talking about uh, child soldiers and and things like that. Um, it could be um, uh, things locally in the sense of uh, even well and and. 
And one of the things we're trying to do also is just change the conversation as to what people talk about. Okay. And so one of the one of the projects that we're kicking off this next year is called is called Silent Heroes. Okay. And so one of the things we've been doing is raising awareness for uh, discussions around the world. But we said, hey, there's so many great stories, positive news, mm-hmm. right here in Charlotte. Right. And so you know, often our headlines are full of scandal, political division, class warfare, uh, just whatever can kind of uh, you know if it bleeds, it leads, right? Mm-hmm. So. What we decided to do is say, hey, how can we challenge the uh, city to say, what is the good news? Who are the silent heroes in our communities that mm-hmm. are great change agents? And so we went uh, to the Levine Museum of the New South and said, hey, the DNC is coming here. The world's going to mm-hmm. come here. Let's show them who makes our city great. Okay. Let's change the conversation from political division or, or you know, all those other things that can kind of pit us against each other, and let's celebrate who makes our city great. And so we've been collecting photographs from people um, who've been just picking up their camera phone and just snapping a photograph of their CMS teacher, bus drivers, um, you know, somebody at, at the bank that's volunteering. You know, basically to say, how can we go beyond the headline of corporate greed mm-hmm. and find someone at the bank who's volunteering? How can we go beyond the headline of, of um, violence in West Charlotte and find that grandmother who's opened up her home and, and serving those people who are suffering from domestic violence. That's cool. You know, so, so that's what we're trying to do. And we've been getting, even Mayor Fox has come on board and uh, taken okay. a photograph of his community hero. And it's been, it's been really and encouraging. Who was his community hero? Can you it, was actually, it, was, it was actually an, an older woman who mentored him when he was younger. And so he, he, he watches her continue to kind of mentor young men in his community. And so he really said she changed his life. So, so, so to do this, you want people to take pictures on their cell phone and then yep. send you con- Caption information along with that? Yeah, if you go to mysilenthero.org, uh-huh. it's just quick as a Facebook post. post you grab a photo, uh-huh. um, and then in 50 words or less, you tell us why that person is your hero. And then that we're going to have every photograph uh, shown at the Levine Museum from July all the way through October. Okay. So right during the <coughs> DNC, when everybody comes here, we're going to have our hero show. And it would cool. seem like you could do an online slideshow with that. Right? Oh, we have it online, too. too. Yeah, yeah so at mysilenthero.org, yeah, you'll yeah. see all the photos. You can flip through them. Oh, yep, so that'll cool. stay up, too, but it'll it'll be up at the Levine. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I do want to go around real quick and, and uh, get your guys' take on an unreported or underreported story of last week. Uh, I'll start with you, Kathleen. Uh, how about the James Beard Foundation Awards, which were just awarded a week ago in New York? And um, I think people think it's a big, you know, fancy culinary thing, and they don't realize that there's a lot of relevant information there on really great cookbooks and um, classic restaurants around the country that get highlighted. Any and you locally? can find that at jamesbeard.org. Okay. All right. Gary? I think um, the whole Bring Your Own Device initiative at CMS, um, which when it was announced was sort of under the radar, now maybe being delayed is sort of under the radar. Okay. Um, the, this chief technology officer who sort of started it left. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know that that's been in the news a lot since there's so much going on talk about Heath Morrison, but I think this is a big issue that he's going to have to deal with when okay. he gets here. And I'm going to go international, back to Burma. Okay. Um, I feel like uh, you got 75,000 uh, people who are refugees because they're a minority group in Myanmar or Burma, and we've been hearing a lot about U.S. sanctions being pulled because of some good things happening there, but nobody's talking about these over 75,000 people okay. who are being oppressed by the government. All right. Well, thank you, folks. Thank you guys for joining us. Come back next week for another great episode. We'll have more great guests, more great topics. Enjoy your week.